Hello, I'm Dr. Denise Struthers, National Director of Training for Healing Communities USA. Healing Communities is a faith-based organization for men, women, and juveniles returning from or at risk of incarceration and for victims of crimes and sexual exploitation, their families, and the larger community. For this presentation, we are partnering with the Department of Justice, and I would like to thank Denise Adams, the fourth district outreach specialist here in Washington, DC, for bringing all of this together. Today, our presenter is Assistant U.S. Attorney Kenya K. Davis. Attorney Davis is the Human Trafficking Coordinator for the District of Columbia U.S. Attorney's Office and also a federal prosecutor investigating and trying complex human trafficking cases in DC Superior Court and US District Court for the District of Columbia. She is a senior trial attorney and the co-chair of the DC Human Trafficking Task Force with the Office of the Attorney General, which is a citywide task force comprised of nearly 75 senior federal and local law enforcement officials, government agency officials, business leaders, and NGO executives. Kenya K. Davis is considered an exceptional trial strategist. Healing Communities and the Department of Justice presents In Our Backyard, Sex Trafficking in Our Nation's Capital. And stick around for an interview with Wendy, who is a survivor of sex trafficking. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for purple mountains in majesty above the fruit and clay. much, Dr. Dr. Struthers. I'm so happy to be able to say that. Um, thank you for this invitation and thank you for your work in this area. I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to jump right into our presentation today. Uh, as Dr. Struthers noted, um, there are uh, human trafficking is an issue that is in our backyard but also beyond our backyard. Uh, and we are often um, faced with how we tackle it uh, in a way that is going to be effective. Um, and so one of the challenges that we have in dealing with uh, human trafficking is understanding that it is an issue that um, it is a crime that has dimensions that uh, make it very difficult for us to bring victims out of it and make them survivors and keep them out of the life. Uh, and just, just as an aside for everyone, as we start this, human trafficking, of course, under the federal rules are defined as any form of um, force fraud coercion that is used to induce someone to perform commercial sex acts, or if the victim is under the age of 18, any um, actions that are taken to have them perform commercial sex acts, meaning it will not require forced fraud or coercion. And then the other dimension of human trafficking is labor trafficking, where uh, someone, as you, as you would imagine, someone is forced, uh, defrauded, or coerced uh, into performing labor 
uh, to the benefit of another individual and not a benefit of themselves. So in there, we have debt bondage and those types of cases. But in our area, what we see mostly are sex trafficking cases. People often ask me what's the hardest part of uh, prosecuting sex trafficking cases. And I always say that it's the domestic violence dimensions of sex trafficking. People uh, have a misperception that sex trafficking involves someone pulling up in a van, jumping out and getting a kid and taking them, kidnapping them and taking them to some far off place uh, to sell them for sex. When the truth of the matter is, is that sex trafficking happens right in our backyard. Uh, it's often happening with kids who are walking around in our schools with young adults who are walking around working regular jobs in addition to um, a in addition to being a part of a sex trafficking uh, scheme. And uh, they, they are being coerced to give over all of their money to uh, a trafficker uh, and and they are being exploited in a way that affects their self-esteem, affects how they see themselves, and also makes them feel as though they're never going to be able to be out in the world doing anything else. Uh, we're going to leave some time for questions at the end, uh, but we'll jump right into domestic violence dimensions of sex trafficking. So the first case I wanted to tell you all about is a case of familial exploitation, meaning that the traffickers here are parents or family members of the victims. In the case of uh, Kathy and Anthony Hart, they were selling sexual favors of their 13 and 14 year old in exchange for gifts and money. And you would think that this was happening just online or in some exotic place, but no, they were making these deals at the public library, at the Walmart in their area and at movie theaters. Uh, and unfortunately their daughters were also victimized through what we call child exploitation materials or child pornography. They were selling pictures of their children uh, for their own financial benefit. Now, people see this and they think, oh, that's just child sex abuse or that's, a, that's just a form of domestic abuse. And that it is. But the fact that they are, again, exploiting these children for the benefits of commercial sex and there is a benefit that they are receiving, i.e. gifts and money, this actually is an instance of trafficking. Uh, the other way that traffickers, so you have the sort of family dynamic of trafficking. Then you have what I call uh, the pseudo family dynamic, right? Where the trafficker sort of creates a family that the victim is now a part of. And this is where we find, you know, young people who may be a part of the foster care system may just be sort of displaced in terms of homelessness. So in a case U.S. versus Dariah Marshall, that I, one of the largest cases that our office prosecuted back in 2018, uh, this case took place right uh, near south, right off of South Capitol Street in Southeast. So less than two miles from where I'm sitting right now at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So not some foreign place off somewhere, but right here. Um, there were four minors in that case, ranging from ages of 14 to 17. They were trafficked on a uh, website called Backpage.com that has now been taking that, taken down by the government. There are several smaller ones that have jumped up in its place, Mega Personals being one. Um, Mr. Marshall met these victims through family members, play cousins, play aunts, um, that we all, you know, we all use those terms, but for children who don't have that sort of, you know, strong family at home, mom, mama, or grandma raising them, then those play cousins and play aunts become, uh, family, uh, for these, for these kids. He took on the big brother role. I'm, you know, I'm just looking out for you. I'm making sure that you have what you need. He was the neighborhood weed man. He was, you know, provided marijuana to everyone, provided alcohol, always was the fun house, the party house. You go there on the weekends uh, when you're visiting your play cousin or you're visiting uh, other family members. And while he's doing this, he is making sure that these girls have all the weed that they want, all of the alcohol that they want, and all they have to do to sort of reimburse him for the fun time is to do these commercial sex dates. So they come on a Friday, he posts them through the weekend, they stay through the weekend, they work through the weekend. And then lo and behold, these were not children that we would have caught um, their exploitation through school records because he was dropping them off at school. One was going to Cardoza uh, High School right here in the District of Columbia. Decent student, you know, not missing school, but still being, in, still being involved in the commercial sex trade. 
Um, he would pick them up. He would drop them off at school. He would encourage them to go to school. Because of course, if they are going to school and no one's really looking for them, they're not a missing child, then no one's really thinking, oh, there's a problem with this baby. Something's going on with her. Nobody's really picking up on that because they're showing up. They, you know, they show up, they're clean, they're, you know, they're doing all the things. Um, he, at times when, when stuff was hard for them at home, he provides shoe, food. He, of course, let them stay at his house over the weekend. But the other sort of family dimension and the way this starts to feel like a pseudo family is he's renaming them, right? When they are with him, they take on a different personality and a different identity that separates the mind from, you know, Kenya, the school student to Mercedes, the person who's being posted on back page, right? So that those dimensions of bonding and care um, become connected to him in a way that is very different than the bond that they may have with their families that actually are, you know, caring for them and want to see what's best for them. He's using them, he's benefiting from them, but he makes it feel like it's a gift uh, to them that he's looking out for them, right? Um, Mr. Marshall, when we initially got Mr. Marshall, Mr. Marshall um, was of course saying, you know, I was only helping them out. And even then uh, up until the end, when he pled guilty uh, the day of trial and he was sentenced, he, he kept saying, well, I thought I was helping them. Um, one of our victims, our youngest victim, when we picked her up initially, her mother was looking for her. When we picked her up initially, she came with us, but then she was back with Mr. Marshall that next week. So it wasn't until we had the arrest warrant for him and we were able to pick him up that she stopped uh, going over to his place. Uh, I'm saying all this to say that uh, the dynamics in that home, right, and I call it a home because it's someone's home, right, the dynamics in that apartment that Mr. Marshall had going over those weekends was very much a domestic violence dynamic. He was, he was hitting his girlfriend in front of the girls. He wouldn't hit them, but he would hit her whenever she wasn't compliant, right, to send a message. This is what happens when you don't do what I ask you to do. That I can turn from big brother into this really bad person that will hurt you if you don't do what I'm asking of you to do, right? So it's kind of a, it's what domestic, it's, it's the cycle that domestic violence follows, right? We all are great and fine. Then we walk on eggshells, then there's an assault and then we're back to, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. Um, and the bonding that happens with a real parent or a pseudo parent can override the abuse that occurs as a result of trafficking, right? So I'm doing this to help out my mom. I'm doing this to help out my dad. I'm doing this so that the authorities don't, and don't, don't come and take me from my mom and dad because they can't provide for me. I'm doing this for my big brother. I'm doing this for my friend who looks out for me because his place is a place I feel comfortable and I can be myself right, or feel comfortable. And yes, there's a price I have to pay. I've got to be a part of this commercial sex industry that I don't necessarily want to be a part of. But the need for belonging, the need for family that we all have is deeper and stronger than any type of exploitation that we may feel from having been part of a commercial sex, in, commercial sex act. So the way I try to explain it to people is anybody who knows anything about child family services knows that kids prefer their parents. No matter how abusive parents may have been, how neglectful parents may have been, the child always wants to come back to the parent, right? No matter how great the foster care family is, they want to come back to the parent because that is their place. That is where they feel most comfortable and they feel a bond to that parent, no matter if that parent's on drugs, no matter if that parent uh, has done something to harm them, they feel a bond. And that's the kind of bond that our sex trafficking victims have with their traffickers. When you're dealing with that kind of bond, you can't just come in and say, oh, I'm here from the government to rescue you. Or I'm here from law enforcement to take you out of here. It doesn't work like that. So in order for us to understand the crime and really get at the root of the domestic violence dimension of it, we have to think about how the, the trafficker picks his victim. Um, and I say his, but that does not mean that all of our traffickers are men. 
there are several who are women as well. Uh, they, tar they pick out their victim. This is not a random, they ran across a kid and they just happened to pick this kid. They study this child. They listen to this child. They spend, he, you know, he could, Mr. Marshall could spend weeks and weeks not ever bringing up commercial sex. You're just smoking weed at his house and enjoying yourself, right? This is just a fun place to be. But all, all the while he's listening and he's gathering information that he can then use to manipulate the kid. Um, friendly conversations. Oh, I had a tough time at home too. You know, things weren't always easy for me. Um, they'll figure out what that child's dream is, what that child's vulnerability is. And I'm saying child, but it can also happen with young people as well. Uh, young men and women who find themselves in this situation. The grooming process is really when the trafficker um, builds that trust, love, and devotion. That's where he builds that bond that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and for parents, of course, if parents are trafficking their children, that kind of is already there, right? Uh, but for a trafficker that's coming from outside the family, sort of trying to create that dynamic, you know, he's picking up, he's picking them up. He's making sure they have what they need. He is saying, you know, with well, that friend of yours that kind of hangs with you at school, she don't seem like she's got your best interest. She, she's trying to get you to cut school. You need to cut her off. Well, that friend may be someone who is watching uh, and may want, may be the kind of person that would have alerted the authorities had they been a part of what's going on with their friend, but they start to isolate them from everybody around them that would be caring. Your mom doesn't understand you. She, you know, yeah, she's feeding you and she's got a house for you, but she don't really care about you like I do. She doesn't understand you the way that I do, right? This is the, this is the grooming process. And then of course, for some, many, uh, there's a sexual relationship that's involved that, you know, for the victim, it feels like this is a person who loves me, cares about me, um, wants what's best for me, makes me feel good, makes me feel grown. Um, and uh, of course, the trafficker is just using um, that grooming in order to be able to get this victim ready for um, what, what's coming out, which is the turning out process. That's when he's going to introduce her to the game. That's when he's going to start saying things like, well, you're already having sex, so why don't you get paid for it? Um, that's when he's going to say, you know, well, you've already had sex for money, so nobody's really going to take you seriously now. You may as well make as much money as you can. Uh, you're not good at managing your money, so I'll hold on to it for you, right? Nobody comes up to a kid and just says, hey, you, I want you to start having sex with people, and I want you to give me the money. That's not how it works, right? It has to be done in a way that makes the victim feel as though it's in the victim's best interest to hand over these funds um, to the trafficker. Uh, that process of breaking the person down and being the only one available to lift them up, we call it seasoning. Uh, and it happens ever so subtly. Uh, and when parents ask me um, about, you know, what is it that allows a trafficker to really get in with a kid, it really is this process of learning the child understanding the child and being able to sort of throw those facts back at them when you know the parent takes the phone or when the parent um and and when i'm saying parent now i'm talking about parents who've been who who at times lose their children to trafficking um when the parent is trying to just be a parent no you can't go out after 10 o'clock right um the trafficker can kind of throw back at them well you know they, they're not being fair to you. you. You did good on your test. You were supposed to be able to go out after 10. If you did good on your test, it's their fault, right? So now we're creating that isolation from the parent, isolation from the family that makes the trafficker seem like the good guy and the parent seem like the bad person, right? That doesn't want them to thrive and be their best selves and all of that. Uh, the naming process is very important. You know, how we know we're a part of a group is how we're named what what our what meaning our names have and what identity we attach to those names and of course the rules and the new language the rules and consequences of the game are taught to the trafficking victim um being able to be chosen choosing people uh, not looking men men in the eye not walking in, in a certain area of the track if they if they do have them out uh on the track all of those rules are just like the kind of rules that exist in domestic violence households, you know, have my dinner ready at this particular time in this way. If it's wrong, 
you know, you've got a punishment coming, right? So that the victim starts to try to always avoid the punishment. And they're so focused on that, that they're not seeing the level of manipulation that's happening to them and how they're losing themselves. So quickly, quickly for you all to just think about when, when I say the terminology or the, the rules, often the game is called the game or the life. The track is the area where the prostitution occurs. And in our area, there are several, but one of the most prominent ones is right at K Street. Um, this is one that, that helped me to start to understand um, the domestic violence dimensions of trafficking. The fact that the pimp is, is referred, the trafficker is referred to as daddy. Uh, and that the people around the, the, the victim when they're in this group with the daddy are the family um, or, and the wife or the wifey, the wife-in-law. Again, all of these sort of nostalgic words that we use to, to connote connection are being used at the same time to uh, exploit uh, our young people. Everybody wants to be a part of a family. Everybody wants to have a dad. Everybody wants to, you know, if, if you're a young lady, a lot of young ladies want to be wives, right? So you can't be a wife, but you can be wifey, right? Or you can't be a sister, but you can have a sister wife, right? Um, as a part of this organization. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is branding. Another sort of way of changing that dimension of who you are, what your identity is, is the branding. Um, putting a name on the person. Goldie, in this particular instance, is the name of the trafficker, right? So this is not a name that this child chose for herself. This is the name of the trafficker. It lets everybody else know that this particular female belongs to Goldie and nobody else can sort of tag her as theirs. Uh, and some people look at this and they say, oh, why would you ever let someone put a, put a mark on you? But this is, this is a sign of belonging. This is a sign of being a part of something where, where someone may not have ever felt a part of anything before. A lot of our um, prostitution nowadays, especially uh, in, light, in light of COVID, um, our online facilitated prostitution, I, I alluded to Backpage before, we have Mega Personals and several other um, uh, online facilitation uh, areas now. Also, things as common as Facebook and Instagram can be used for recruiting purposes and also for communication um, between the trafficker and the victim and also uh, for purposes of advertisement. So that can happen. We are going to skip some of these. Uh, here's an example of an online advertisement. Um, and what I, what I like to point out with this is that, of course, they're going to say uh, that this victim is 18, uh, but it's very likely that if they're listing that, that means that she's not 18. Um, but it's it's almost as it's it's weird because it's almost like a signal to the person that you're going to get somebody a little younger, uh, and if the, if that's what the customer is looking for, that's what they'll have. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these because we're we're uh, we don't want to be too close in time, but there is in fact. Um, in our area, um, gang facilitated trafficking. And this is just another family, right? We always talk about boys picking gangs because they want to be a part of something. They want to identify with something. Well, the same goes for uh, when a gang is using trafficking as a means of uh, keeping itself afloat, keeping itself, itself financially uh, solvent. Uh, Trafficking can just be, a, sex trafficking can be another dimension of that, just like um, drug trafficking can be. And what I, we always talk about is that with gang trafficking in particular, there are two things that are going on. One, there is the sort of feeling of belonging in terms of being a part of this huge group of people who all identify together. But two, it means that the person, the trafficked victim feels as though eyes are everywhere right? That there are so many members of this gang, there are so many members uh, that they don't know, right? That the traffic can say to them, well, you know, if you try to run, so-and-so is going to see you. Or there, you know, we have people, we have eyes and ears everywhere. They'll see you and they'll bring you right back and you'll be in big trouble, right? So the victim really does feel that there's nowhere, there's nowhere to go in terms of being able to escape the gang. A lot of our uh, large gang trafficking cases happen right there in the Eastern District of Virginia. 
this was one of our um, gang members that was uh, prosecuted. Um, uh, he received uh, 40 years, Mr. Justin Strong. Now this is a case where girls were brought in from another uh, jurisdiction. They were, they were made to travel here. Uh, these text messages are text messages that were uh, sent to the, the victims as they were uh, in, the, in the detective's car. So these victims had been picked up on a sting and the, the, the trafficker knew that they had been picked up and he hadn't been picked up yet. So he was still trying to uh, communicate with them. He was still trying to make a connection to them so that he could uh, continue to control them even as they were in the car with uh, the detectives. These young ladies uh, did have uh, books full of phone numbers. Now, of course, that would be uh, numbers that would be uh, in their phone, kept in their phone, but these were uh, paying customers, what they would call regulars that they would, that they would know would um, try to keep contacting them. So do, do victims think that they are victims, right? Um, often our victims don't think that they're victims at all, right? That they are part of something that they chose to be a part of. Uh, and our culture sort of reinforces that idea that this is your choice. You chose this, no matter how young the victim is. And also no matter how much manipulation has happened to bring them into uh, the light. So many times our victims distrust outsiders and law enforcement. Um, they, they not only, one of the things I learned as I've been doing this work for the last I've been a lawyer for 20 years, but I've been doing this work for about seven years. Uh, and one of the things I learned that I was surprised by is, you know, I'm from, a, I'm from Georgia. Um, you know, I'm always very inviting and very open. And I'm like, oh, victims are going to, you know, identify with me. They're going to want me to come right in and be their friend. And we're going to work together. And we're going to solve these cases. And one lady, one, one victim told me what she said, well, you know what? You remind me of the social worker that took me from my parents. And I was like, of course I do, because I work in a government building, you know, I'm an official of the government, and I'm telling her to, to get away from this person that she's developed a bond with. And so I really had to unpack um, how it is that our victims see us when they first come into um, the quote unquote rescue stage. They are not inviting. They don't want to tell us what happened. They are bonded to someone who's been there for them. And the systems that we represent have failed them, right? If I'm looking like the social worker, then I'm somebody who has taken them from a family and, and home that they love, no matter how bad it was, right? And I've placed them somewhere that may or may not have been a good placement for them. And so that is how they identify me. And that's not their fault. That's something that I have to contend with as a professional, and I have to assure them and show them they can trust me and be a part of this process, that, that this time it will be different, that the law enforcement officers that they work with as a part of the program that we're bringing them into will be a different, will be a different experience for them. And that's not always easy to convey, but we all, as professionals that work in this area, we always have to remember that that's on us, that's not on the victim. Um, they blame themselves for their predicament, and we have to be careful not to let anyone that's involved in the process that, that is coming from our side um, continue to do that. And you'd be surprised uh, at, at how much of a gatekeeper you have to be around your cases to make sure that those dimensions don't seep in. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Struthers can speak to the fact that when you're involved in ministry, for instance, the church wants to help, but the church also wants to you know, give out these narratives about fast tail girls. And that's not those two, you can't do both, right? You've got to be inviting and you've got to change your rhetoric around this particular crime. Uh, because if you, if you, if you say things like fast tail girls, if you say things like that, that, that sort of convey slut shaming or anything like that, it's going to sound exactly like what the traffickers said that they would face. And it's going to, it's going to reinforce the narrative that nobody cares about you now. You, you've been out here selling sex. Nobody cares about you, right? And they'll continue to go back. Uh, many victims um, may have been beaten or raped by the trafficker, but they still feel that bond to the trafficker that is stronger than anything that we can establish with them. And of course, a lot of them show allegiance to the trafficker 
we can't be uh, deterred by that. Uh, we have to provide mental health services. We have to provide wraparound services so that our victims feel empowered. Um, I just noted here, just as an aside, especially for safety reasons, that we have to be aware of the fact that they may be suicidal at the point that they come to us because we've upended their entire world. And though that world was rough, right? It was rough and no one would, would, would imagine it to be a place you'd want to stay. Uh, it is very different to now be in this space where they don't know what's going to happen day to day. So we have to make sure that we are looking into... Um, or we are looking to wrap around services for them, housing, food, medical, uh, safety and security, mental health assistance, income assistance. Uh, remember, uh, and, and for our uh, immigrant uh, victims, we, we have to deal with immigration issues. Remember, the trafficker was in control of everything. The trafficker had all the resources. So the victim at times will come out of that situation with absolutely nothing, maybe not even a cell phone. Um, and so we have to be ready to step into the gap and anything that we're not providing, right? Any need that we're not meeting, is going to look like they don't really care. They don't really care and they don't really want you to come out. And so you should go back into something that you know, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to have what you need if you stick with me, right? Um, so I'm going to uh, do this one last thought just to convey that we need to take a non-judgmental non approach to our victims. We need to be understanding, we need to understand the trauma. We need to in, um, invest in an empathy mindset and not a sympathy mindset. They don't want anyone to feel sorry for them, but they do want you to understand where they're coming from. Uh, we need to really assess the need and provide those resources. We need to look for uh, empowerment uh, points. I always ask my victims uh, and my survivors, what is it that you want to do with your life? Because I know you didn't, at six years old, seven years old, say, when I get to be 18, I want to go do commercial sex, right? Nobody does that. People do it out of need, and they do it out of what, they, what they've experienced and the level of manipulation that has happened. So you want to get them back to thinking about who is it that I want to be, and what how do I want to invest in myself? And how do I want this big group of people who've now come to help me, how do I want them to invest in me? Um, and you'd be surprised at some of the mentorship relationships that have come out of uh, this work. Some of our victims have become um, survivor advocates. Some of our victims um, have started their own organizations. Uh, victims, when, once they're empowered, they really can uh, do the work that needs to be done to, to help themselves. But they've got to have those first steps. They really have to have those first steps of being really wrapped around um, and inculcate it from the life because it, it, it seems so easy to just go back to it because it's something that they know. I'm gonna stop here so that we can get um, uh, questions uh, from the audience. And uh, Dr. Struthers, I'll turn it over to you for that. And so we do have a couple of questions. Let me put my glasses on so I can see it. <laughs> right. Okay, question number one comes from Samuel and he asks, how much more difficult would the U.S. versus Darian Marshall case be if all the facts were the same except the victims were adults? And I'm guessing you know what case that is. So uh, that's a great uh, question, Sam. And that's part of why we have to do the sort of outreach work. It's sort of the extra burden of the, of the human trafficking prosecutor that maybe other prosecutors don't have because their crimes are sort of understood off the bat. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to do this sort of awareness work uh, for people to understand that even victims who aren't walking around with bruises may have been forced, defrauded, um, or coerced into being uh, 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 victims of commercial sex acts. So the, the next case, the next big case that our office handled was the United States versus Terrell Armstead. Uh, and though that case is still pending, I can't talk a, a great deal about it, but all of our victims there uh, at the time that we got involved in the case were adults. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had to show coercion through the use, through uh, uh, the defendant using guns that he displayed for the victims, right? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't actually shoot at them, but he let them know these guns are available to me. 
right? There were times that he would hit them and other times when he wouldn't, he wouldn't, there were other girls in the operation that he wouldn't hit at all, right? Um, so again, that domestic violence component of you don't quite know where it's coming from. You don't know if this person's going to love you today or beat you up today, right? That sort of trauma bonding that happens to bind them to, to, the, to the trafficker, but also the trauma of them having to deal with that domestic violence component of this person. I really can't trust this person, but this is all I have. This is the only person I have. I'm isolated from my family. I'm isolated from everyone around me. So I have to sort of put up with whatever it is this person's dishing out. So yes, the, the adult cases are much more difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. We handle those cases here in, in, um, in DC and also the Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit. I like to give, give uh, a lot of credit to them. The Human Trafficking Prosecution Unit at Maine Justice, they handle those cases all over the country and they focus on adult victims. Mm -hmm. Question number two is, as an outsider looking on, what is my role and how are trafficked persons identified? The most important piece of this, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, is your willingness to help. Um, we are always in need of uh, volunteers. We are always in need of people to do the work. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you may be surprising to you. Uh, one of my colleagues noted it today that you know, there, there may not be space because, because trafficking has now become a popular thing to, to want to be a part of in terms of, of uh, combating it. And that's great. Uh, but our victims are at schools. They are at domestic violence centers. They are at rape crisis centers. They are at food banks. Mm. They are at hospitals, right? Any of those places, if you provide resources to those, to those organizations or you provide your time and your energy, lo and behold, you're going to bump up against uh, a trafficking victim or survivor, um, even if you're not specifically um, targeting that person when you are doing that volunteer work. And then you asked about persons being identified and targeted. So we have a, a national hotline uh, that uh, persons can call in order to um, uh, identify any type of trafficking that they observe. And I tell people all the time, you're not the detective, you're not the prosecutor, you're not the judge, right? So what we need from you is information. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to put a whole case together, right? Because you call in the tip that you have and that tip may get matched up with another tip that gets us closer and closer to the trafficker, right? So you call that hotline for anything that you may see. Our victims are identified in, a, in several different ways. There are organizations that our victims may present themselves to. We found victims through hospitals in terms of them coming in for an injury and the, and the doctor or the nurse being uh, trauma-informed and trained to, to know what they're looking at, right? Um, and, and calling in a tip. Uh, we have had victims come through other cases, through domestic violence cases, uh, through sex assault cases, through child pornography cases. Our victims are identified in, in so many different ways. Uh, it really is, there's really no way to say like, this is the typical way that a victim comes to us. Um, but that, and that's why everybody has to be trained, right? So that everybody can, can be on alert and know what they're looking at and know what they're looking for. And not always you know, not have this sort of false notion that it's going to be a kid in some chain somewhere, that that's going to be the trafficking victim. Because not, I, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I have yet to meet a child in chains that is a trafficking victim. The, the kids who come in here and the young people who come in here come in, you know, they're dressed sometimes to the nines and sometimes they're not, but they don't, they don't you can't tell it just from looking at them is what I'm trying to, to convey. Question number three is from Erica, and she says, I'm a writer who has covered some of the phenomena of human trafficking in my adult writing, but I wonder how we should be raising the awareness to children without exposing or traumatizing them. Great, great question. Um, and uh, I'm a mom myself. Uh, and I'm always trying to come up with creative ways. We have an organization called NICMIC. Uh, that's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. 
they have put together a phenomenal set of resources. You can go on their website, uh, resources, advising children around um, things that they can understand, i.e. Uh, safe and healthy relationships, uh, safe and healthy touch. Often, uh, especially when we're talking about child exploitation, uh, people say, oh, don't, don't talk to strangers. Well, I can guarantee you by the time a trafficker is trafficking your child, they're not a stranger. Uh, they are their best friend and they are their, their play uncle, their play cousin, their, their big brother, right? Uh, the child is on the lookout and the danger has been set for a stranger and not this person who's right here next to them. So what, what the child has to learn is what's appropriate in a relationship what's appropriate touch, if they feel uncomfortable, they don't have to comply with an adult when they're made to feel uncomfortable about the autonomy of their bodies, right? And those are lessons that we can teach all children, whether they're at risk for trafficking or not. The other piece of this is uh, online uh, safety. If that child has that cell phone, there are so many cases that we have had of child exploitation that come through a child having a cell phone and having an inappropriate connection with an adult. Of course, the child doesn't know that that's an adult initially. And of course, the child, even when they do know it's an adult, doesn't think it's an adult that's gonna do them any harm, it's that they're gonna take pictures or that they're gonna sort of try to blackmail them with pictures, right? And so we have to teach children how to be responsible with uh, the online materials that they have. And that sort of body autonomy talk, re uh, proper relationship talk, internet safety talk, I have found that it's less likely to tra quote unquote traumatize children uh, than, you know, talking to them about being on the track and that kind of stuff. They're not going to understand that anyway, but they're going to understand that in their world, if they see something that's, that's that, and that, and that, that thing makes them uncomfortable that they should bring it to their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the last thing I'll say, Ms. Erica, is that uh, the, the other piece of this that I tell parents all the time, listen to your children. Sometimes when they're just sort of babbling off at the mouth, right? And they're talking about things that you don't think necessarily are important and you're kind of busy and you got a lot going on in your head. I'll tell you this, a trafficker will sit and listen to your child for three hours and have them and let them babble on about whatever they want to babble on. Because what is that trafficker doing? They're gathering information, yes. right? Yes. You, we have to fight fire with fire. If they, they don't need to feel a, a stronger sense of belonging with someone who's going to do them harm than they do with the people who love them and care for them, right? So we have to be there and we have to listen. And, and, and Dr. Struthers can speak to this in terms of the church. Like the church is a great place to have healthy relationships with children, for children to feel like I can talk to, to mother so-and-so about anything. She's not going to judge me. She's not going to talk to me like, you know, I don't belong. She's going to treat me with respect. And those types of connections makes it real hard for a trafficker to come, trafficker to come along and say, don't nobody care about you. That's right. You know, because you've got that connection. Did you have another question, Ms. Erica? I, I do. Um, thank you for that. I, I wanted to, you know, you were saying something about uh, kids being at risk. And so, you know, I guess the thing that I'm not 100% clear on is I understand how some kids can be more at risk, right? Because they are in more fragile sort of home situations or living situations mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. don't have the wraparound supports. But it, it feels to me like so many more kids than that sort of subgroup of kids um, is at risk insofar as, um, you know, so many are, are walking around with a supercomputer in their back pocket, right, or in their backpack. And so um, it just feels like, you know, I mean, I talk to my children, they're 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. um, and for as much as they seem to know, you know, I'm, I'm always struck by the fact that they are 12 and 14, right? They just don't have the perspective on certain things um, that we do, you know, and, and so I, I try not to be sort of to send myself out into the stratosphere about it, but at the same time, I do think to myself, gosh, you know, I, I think a lot more kids are quote unquote at risk than, than we think. And maybe that's mm -hmm. part of the problem is that we're not talking to enough kids. And so yeah. that's, that, that's kind of what I was 
getting at with the first mm -hmm. question about like, what is it that we're supposed to be saying? Because I think that people think you have to have, you know, housing or food insecurity, which are significant issues, right? Right, I'm not right, to right, right. But yeah, you don't, but you don't have to, right? Right. Um, so I, so I, I'll give you a great example of this. So um, uh, a few years ago, we had a case where a defendant start talking to a young lady on Instagram. Well, she wasn't a young lady, she was 11. Um, got her interested in him, of course, said he was a teenager. He wasn't. Got her to send him some pictures, got her to uh, do some videos for him. Um, and then as it progressed, he actually got her to agree to have him pick her up from a camp out in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, he went out there, he got her, he brought her back. He sexually assaulted her, took her back out there, dropped her off. And he thought it was all said and done. This kid had some of the best parents I've ever met. Uh, very attentive, you know, were checking her phone, but they weren't checking the Kick app. And that's the app that he was using to communicate with her, right? Um, but she got all the support and the case was successful. Of course, you know, we would, we would rather it have not happened at all. But she's a, but her case is a good example of how, like you're saying, it can happen anywhere. What I tell parents about that kind of case is that the best part of, well, to me, the thing that, that those parents did best of all was that they did not convey to their child that she would get in more trouble by telling them than if she told them what she had done and how she had been a part of it and what this adult had done. So that means I go and speak to Boy Scout and Girl Scout groups. I go and speak to Jack and Jill, right? And those kids are supposed to have all the things, right? Um, but the reason I do that is because sometimes in those environments, those children are given very high expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they've made a mistake, like they've sent a picture and now someone's blackmailing them to meet up somebody's blackmailing them to send more pictures they are so afraid of letting their parents down and disappointing that their their parents they won't tell and so the trafficker get the, the the person who wants to exploit them continues to get more and more control because the kid feels closed off from these parents that may you know we may be living in a six-bedroom house mm -hmm. um and but that child feels emotionally closed off from that parent that's why I always say that it is the it is the trafficker's fault. It is the ex exploiter's fault. It's the adult's fault. It's not the child's fault ever. And never should a parent ever approach a situation where they say, "Well, you know, I taught you this. I taught you that. You shouldn't have done that." Of course, they they already know they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have talked to the person in the first place. But what we want to get at is, we're trying to protect you from further exploitation and we want to protect other children from this person. So let, we're going to work together and I'm going to empower you as the child to help us work together to get this person uh, held accountable. And I think parents who can really embrace that have kids who are resilient and can get through this and also have kids who feel comfortable telling their parents before it goes that far, right? Because you're never going to know everything that's on that phone. I mean, it's just, it, like you said, it's a supercomputer. It's walking around with us every day, right? Um, and, and, and I tell my boys all the time, you know, you have access to all the information in the world. Guess what? All the world have access to you through this phone. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and so that's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about you doing something irresponsible. I'm con it's just like with driving. I'm, I'm driving to protect our family from all the other people that are driving, mm -hmm. not that I don't think I'm a decent driver, although my, my husband might differ in his opinion. But you know what I'm saying? Like I'm I, when I when I put safety measures on your phone, when I go to the Nick Nick website and I download these apps that 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 provide extra safety on your phone, it's not for you. I I do think you're responsible, but it's for all the sort of unseen um, possibilities that we have to protect against. Good, good. And I, I like one thing uh, that you just said is that I do trust you. We cannot be with them all the time. And so we extend to them trust and we don't want to hover over them. But at the same time, we do let them know that there is real danger that's out there, especially 
on social media. The good news is that Shared Hope International has uh, material that is for elementary age kids, junior high, high school, and adult material that you can uh, use in presentations uh, for your congregation or for classrooms or for those who are in uh, the brownies and, and, and things like that. And we want to make sure that we are communicating this to both boys and girls. That is very important. Question number four is, is how can faith-based organizations with limited resources provide these wraparound services? <laughs> That's the question of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I will tell you, I, I you first think that I will say, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, you go ahead, oh, this is your theory. <laughs> I, I, I will say, you do not need to reinvent the wheel. Amen. You know, uh, if you are, if your resources are limited, uh, like for an example, uh, the uh, Phoenix Dream House or uh, mm. Dream Church, uh, they are able to provide housing, clothing, food, and all of that. They are a very large ministry. Uh, so what the work that they're doing is phenomenal. Uh, you can become a part of them you, uh, if you know you're helping locals that's there uh, in that area. But right here, there's Courtney House um, that you can partner with. Uh, if You can do internships with Courtney House. Probably all of them will allow you to do that. You can volunteer at any of them. Of course, they always need funding. Um, you can raise money. Your church can raise money in uh, the community uh, for them. Uh, you can, uh, what else? There's, I mean, it's just so much like the National Coalition of uh, Child Exploitation. They have um, a, a, a workshop every year that you can participate in and communicate with people from all over the world um, about what's going on with sex trafficking. So if you're not uh, as knowledgeable knowledgeable about it. There's uh, people out there that's willing uh, to train you and give you all of the information that you need. So it's right here. It's at your fingertips. And it's just a phone call away. Really, it's just a Google away, to be honest with you, uh, that you can Google anyone. And um, I would suggest that um, as a faith-based organization, that you guys begin with prayer. You know, stop praying for them and uh, mm. shared hope international. I'm saying I'm using them because I'm getting these emails from them all the time. But they have a prayer, uh, a weekly prayer for uh, young girls that are being trafficked. So that's something else that uh, you can participate in as well. Just one last thing I'll add, Dr. Struthers, is that, and I can say this because my husband's a minister. Um, we, especially in our churches, um, we, we are sometimes not as sensitive to our young people, uh, our young people who are uh, dealing with all types of issues, who uh, are um, our LGBTQ young people who find themselves um, outside of the church and outside of their homes and families are particularly vulnerable to traffickers. We use language like prostitute, child prostitute, promiscuous, um, fast, easy, all of that. All of that is just fuel for the trafficker, right? Because that judgment is what the child is trying to get away from. Uh, and they're not gonna get judged by the trafficker. Trafficker's gonna say, look, this is just a way to make money. And if they don't understand it, then it's their fault, right? And so we have to continue. If you notice, when I'm even when I'm talking about teens, even when I'm talking about young women, young men, I'm using words like the victim, the survivor, the child, yes. right? These are children yes. whose frontal cortex has not developed enough to even make executive decisions mm -hmm. that they should permanently have to live with. But they're having to make those, those types of decisions because we haven't done what we're supposed to do for them. And we got to own that, right? Um, and so we have to 
watch our mouths. We have to watch how we are connecting with our young people. And we've got to help them understand that they have a home with us, mm-hmm. that this is a place they can come, that they're going to be safe, that people are not going to say crazy stuff to them, mm-hmm. right? And make them feel like they should be outside of uh, the kingdom. So I think we have to do that work. It's our work to do. Um, and the more that we do that and the more we start to really in our own minds change how we think about this crime, change who we put the fault on and who we place the responsibility with, mm-hmm. right? Because we haven't even talked about buyers. We yes, haven't sir. even talked about people who help facilitate, right? Um, these crimes, right? Mm-hmm. All those grown people that were around R. Kelly that helped mm-hmm. him do what he did. Yes, All sir. of us who watched and thought, oh, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know what's going on with him, but girl, I like step in the name of love. <laughs> like we all have to take responsibility for what we're seeing. And we have to say to victims, look, we're here for you. We don't care about that other person. We are here for you. We want you to be safe. We want you to have what you need. Um, and the more that we can talk that way and walk that way, the less of our children will lose to this crime. Because it's hard to get them back once they're out there. Yes. But we can and we will. We'll continue to fight to get them back. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, this is from another Kenya, Kenya Craven, who said, this has been awesome to an extent that it starts with us. Lord, help us to be more sensitive, more deliberate, more doing our part. It costs us nothing to listen to our young people or anyone for that matter. Thank you so much, Kenya, for that comment. And I would just like to add to that, that with Healing Communities, we train faith-based organizations on how to come outside of the four walls, become active with uh, the community and other organizations, how to work with victims, removing the judgment, the stigmatizations, and really how to get to know them. That we're not just so uh, concerned about uh, getting them washed or getting them clean, but we're really there to serve them. And no one cares how much we know until they know how much we care. And that is the key. that you are willing to do this. Thank you, thank you so much. How are you? I mean, what's your story? Tell, tell yeah. me about it. Okay, so I can go way back. I am well. Um, today's a good day. <laughs> um, it goes back, my biological father passed away 10 years ago, but he was actually one of my initial 
abusers, Mm -hmm. sexually, mentally, physically, emotionally. And he trafficked me for a while when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was mainly to his friends. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness it's, it ended. Um, But it was, very, very hard on me. Um, And then fast forward to 2017. um, I did not know about trafficking. Like I didn't know that it happened here. And I was looking for love in all the wrong places. And so when there's this man who's just like, I'm agent, I, you know, help girls, I can like do like, if you want to be an escort and I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I don't necessarily want to be out and doing stuff. And he's just like, well, you can do like photography and photo shoots with me. Like I'm a photographer and you know, it's not your time, your money. And I'm, I'm like, I fell for the charm. So I was just like, okay, perfect. Awesome. He wound up raping me and beating me and then tricking me. And he said, if I don't give him his quota, which was up to $300 a night, um, that I would suffer with consequences. Mm-hmm. And so I believe that God got me out um, in a horrible way that he got me out. It was two weeks of pure hell like that this man put me through. But I wound up getting um, sepsis from hidden gonorrhea that was laying dormant in my body mm-hmm. from one of the tricks. And I was in the ICU for seven days. And I believe that God saved my life. And that's what got me out of the life. Wow. Um, because, you know, God knew that I wasn't going to die. But he, it was a wake-up call. Like, I'm getting you out, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just been an uphill battle. I um currently still have my case open. I was made aware of what trafficking was in 2018 by two amazing detectives Mm -hmm. um, over in my city of Boise, which is like 10 minutes from where I live now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a still open case. And what's really hard for me is that, yes, there needs to be way more awareness and way more um, advocacy because my trafficker is still out there and he's well known in the community. Like he's well known, like I'm a married man, I have family, you know, and he's a prospective leader in our community. So there needs to be a rise in call for action because trafficking happens everywhere. Trafficking can happen to, because a lot of people think that it's just like the, the ones who are in poverty or lower class and it's like, no, it can be the straight A student. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be, you know, the one that's struggling like I was searching for love. Um, it just, it happens everywhere and there needs to be way more um, advocacy and um, training on that because I feel like a lot of people do. They just believe, including law enforcement, that it's only like a specific type or specific group of people right. in it, it needs to be way more known that that's not the case right. and that, you know, um, men usually are the ones that drive and you need, or they need that. They need that high. They need that, you know, it's, it's tragic to me yeah. that it's yeah. become such a problem that it makes more money globally yeah. Yes. than drug trafficking and I'm like how has it gotten that bad right right you know um I mean I'm amazing I'm so very happy that um you know whatever situation got used uh to get you out of it, it was certainly um a blessing and really a miracle yes, it was. Because, um I I know that less than one percent um uh make it out of 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 that lifestyle and yeah. usually it's because they have become so accustomed um that's one reason another is fear and yep. um you know and just really not knowing uh who they can trust as a survivor what do you uh want to what do you need from the community like 
what is it that you want to be able to say, uh, you know, to young girls who, who are out there, you know, and, and like yourself, searching for something. Uh, they're, yeah. not, they're not even, they can't really identify. They just know, oh, you know, uh, maybe they've grown up in um, an abusive household or something like that. Yeah. What would you say to that young girl? First of all, it was never your fault. This is not your fault where you are right now. Um, it can be very scary, but please know that you're loved. And there are others that, you know, your pimp might be threatening you. Your pimp might be saying, you know, I'll, I'll kill you if you ever go to anybody, but just know that there are ways mm -hmm. and everybody's here for you. My biggest thing looking back is I just, I look at myself now, um, how I was back then. And I just say, you're a daughter of God. Like mm -hmm. you are so loved, whether you are a believer or not a believer, there's someone who loves you. And I know that God is that powerful. Um, and it may seem like you have no hope, no, no way of getting out, but that's not true. You just have to keep fighting and just know that you are, you are loved. There are people who care. Yes, absolutely. And I think that that is definitely, if I could have a conversation with every traffic woman, girl, boy, and man, mm -hmm. I would definitely say to them that there are people who care who are just uh, ready to do whatever it takes to put um, exactly. into it, who are hurt because you guys are hurting and want to see, you know, all of this come to uh, an, an end and for uh, you guys to receive the healing and the nourishment and, and everything uh, that is needed. Uh, for you to heal properly and to go on and, uh, you know, uh, help someone else uh, to come Absolutely. out of it.